Here's the deal. We're all pretty smart. I mean, this is the information age. We finally arrived and now ooze with intelligence. However, it wasn't always like it is today. About 2,000 years ago, a guy named Ptolemy thought that the universe revolved around the Earth. And it wasn't until about 500 years ago that people realized, hey, maybe this Earth isn't flat. Sure, that was the Stone Age, but it's still been a slow process for man. But even the past 100 years has been filled with misguided wisdom. Check it. In 1899, the Patent Office president was ready to close up shop because, according to him, everything that could be invented had been. Gosh, I can't think of anything that's been invented since then. Let me think. Hmm. Anyway. Or how about Wilbur Wright in 1901 saying man would not fly for 50 years? Uh, Wilbur, thanks for the first successful flight only a couple of years after you said that. Oh, here's a favorite of mine. In 1908, Henry Ford's lawyer said, The horse is here to stay. The automobile is only a novelty, a fad. Wow, you got two things wrong in one quote. And undermine your client's work. That's impressive. Well, you know this one. A technical journal said, and I quote, The Titanic is made practically unsinkable. Except for the fact that it sank. That last part was me, not the quote. Or how about when Henry M. Warner of Warner Brothers asked a doozy. He said, who wants to hear actors talk? I'm like, uh, everybody, unless it's a Keanu movie. Or this, the father of radio said in 1967, men will never reach the moon regardless of all future scientific advances. This quote became garbage two years later. Or how about the founder of IBM who once said, there is a world market for maybe five computers. Add about eight zeros and you hit it right on the head, buddy. Okay, that's enough. Now look, I realize some of these comments were somewhat recent. But here's the cool part. I think the tide has finally turned and we have reached a state of enlightenment. Because honestly, we're stinking smart. Now, it is okay to say that man has all the answers. I mean, it, hey, what's that? Wait, I can't, hang on, I can't read this backwards, let me see. What? This is ridiculous. Hey, who put this here? Hey, Tony, well, go find out. This is crazy, guys. Is this a joke? No, of course I'm mad. This is ridiculous. Oh, yeah? Well, we'll just see about that, won't we? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm out of here, pal. Hey, move. I'm gone. I am gone. Hello and thank you for joining us today for week two of our sermon series on Watch the Throne where we're going to be talking about some of the kings of the Old Testament and how they compare and contrast with our true Lord, our true King, Jesus Christ. Today we're going to talk about King Solomon. We're going to look at some of the famous passages and maybe some unknown passages to you that deal with King Solomon or help make the connection of his kingship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're really excited to have you here today as we worship our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We seek to grow spiritually during these days of Lent. As we continue on in our service today, we hope and pray that you'll join us as we use one of the historic creeds of the faith, the Nicene Creed. So would you confess with me as we confess together saying, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and descended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Today your mercy 
As we continue on in our service and we invite the Lord into our presence, we also hear through our responsive reading some of the words of King Solomon recorded in Scripture. But first, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. May we be counted among the righteous, known by grace and compassion. May we be known by what is holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we might have the wisdom of Solomon to govern our temporal affairs. May his instructions give us insight into the ways of man so that we might make connections between the worldly and spiritual kingdoms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we start to talk about King Solomon, we want to set the stage for his reign. King Solomon was the son of King David, and he did a lot of things, had a lot of great accomplishments and achievements, not just during his life, but during his reign as king. The most notable was probably that he built the temple in Jerusalem. Now, his father, King David, had wanted to build the temple, but God spoke to King David and said, that is not for you. I have reserved that honor for your son, King Solomon. And so that, in addition to many other things, really set the stage for what Solomon was able to accomplish during his time as leading the people of Israel. And so as we think about King Solomon and the wonderful things that he did, we're going to start in 2 Chronicles chapter 1 because this is going to be the focal point or it's going to be kind of what accentuates his time as king. And so we start with verse 7 of 2 Chronicles chapter 1. In that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to David my father, and have made me king in his place. O Lord God, let your word to David my father be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. 
Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours which is so great? God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart. You have not asked possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings had who were before you, and none after you shall have the like." So this passage is truly going to set the stage for King Solomon. And I think this is a powerful, powerful passage. And honestly, it's one of my most favorite passages in all of Scripture because I have tried to think through the lens of King Solomon in my time as pastor over years and years and years. Would I have the courage, would I have the strength, and would I have the faith if God asked me whatever I wanted, would I truly have the humility To say, look, I don't need possessions, I don't need this, I don't need that. Just give me wisdom and a discerning heart that I can lead the people of whom you have given me charge. We don't know exactly how old King Solomon was. Some people speculate he might have been in his 20s. Other people speculate that maybe he was 8, 9, 10, maybe 12 years old. But it seems that he was younger when he took on the mantle of being king. is He understood that there was a lot that he needed to learn, that there was a lot that needed to happen in order for him to become a great king. But however old he was, even at that time, he had the insight to understand that wisdom and understanding and knowledge And the discernment to be able to lead people was going to give him more opportunity, more grace, more hope than any of the riches of this world. Chances are, growing up, when he's seeing his his dad, King David, he saw all the riches and all of the splendor that the king already had. And he said, do I need more and more and more of this right now? What is something that I can have that perhaps maybe my father did not have that I can use in great and rich supply. Something that is going to set me apart. Not just make my name great, but make your people, make your name great. Make the nation of Israel great in all of the world. And so he said, give me wisdom. I seek to lead this people well. And it's interesting, he says, look, Heavenly Father, you've already given my dad so much. And he probably grew up and understood all of the wonderful things that his dad, King David, had. And he probably wants to kind of keep going in that. He wants to be a good successor to his dad, knowing that God was truly with King David and had blessed him abundantly. And he'd seen the faith of his father, and no doubt he wanted that same faith. And he knew already because of the way in which God had spoke to his father about not being the one to build the temple, that he, Solomon, was going to be the one who was going to be charged with building the temple. And, and so part of that, he sees all of these things that are going to be the expectations upon him. And the more wisdom he had, the more it was going to be a window into how he could lead better. And so I think the best part of this passage is just the way in which we can reflect on our own lives and the way in which we can reflect on how we stand before God and when we ask things of God. What are our intentions? And how can we use the blessings that God gives to us in greater and richer supply? How can we make the name of God greater? And I believe that's thinking in the same way that Solomon is thinking. Lord, if you just give me more wisdom, it's going to help me be able to discern things better in this life and in this world so that I can make better decisions for myself and I can help exalt your name for all the wonderful things that you have first done for me. May that be our guide as we continue in this service. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for the wisdom of Solomon. and We thank you for, uh, no matter how old he was when he asked for greater wisdom, we just pray that that would be what we ask as well. 
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we just pray especially that you would continue to watch over and care for us in all things. Whatever we might need, Lord, we ask that you would provide as we come before you humbly and seek your grace. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that there are still many people in our world that are hurting, that are broken in spirit. And wherever people are struggling, wherever people are hurting, Lord, we just pray that you would be with them and that you would watch over and care for and alleviate their suffering as you do. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we continue to think of our midweek services. We think of our Sunday services. We think of all the preparation leading up to Easter. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would help us as we seek to do these great things for you and in your name. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we think of all other churches as well as they continue to plan for Easter and throughout the Lenten season, that you would bless them and be with them during this time. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we think of all of the areas of our country uh, that continue to uh, need help because of uh, greater uh, cases of COVID. Uh, Lord, that through the vaccines that are out there and through your intervention that you would uh, alleviate some of that pain. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we just continue to pray for all people in our communities around us that you would watch over and open their hearts to the message of the gospel. For these prayers and all the other prayers that are on our hearts, Lord, we lift them to you now. In the name of your Son, Jesus, who has taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, think on me and purge us As we continue on, we hear a great passage that demonstrates the great wisdom that God had given to King Solomon. We continue in 2 Chronicles, but we move forward to chapter 9. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions, having a very great retinue and camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from Solomon that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants and their clothing, his cupbearers and their clothing, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. 
But I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, half the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You surpass the report that I heard. This queen of Sheba lived quite a distance away from Israel. Said it was perhaps a thousand to a twelve hundred mile journey in order for her to come up to visit King Solomon in Israel. And as the text says, she came with quite the entourage. Her land was known for its spices. Her land was known for prosperity. And she brought it all because she had heard even a thousand miles away of the wisdom of Solomon. When you can reign and when you can rule with that kind of grace and that kind of opportunity, the word's going to get out and other people are going to hear about it, even that far away. 3,000 years ago, they didn't need social media. They didn't need Facebook. They didn't need YouTube. They didn't need emails for the word to spread about King Solomon. God had richly blessed him. And this queen wanted to come and see what it was about. And so she thought about all the different things that she could say, all the different questions she had. King Solomon, in his wisdom, understood what she was asking, maybe some of the places she was trying to trap him. But it sure seems that he took the time, patiently answered all the questions, had great long dialogue and discourse. And she looked around at all of the things that he had already accomplished up until this point. And she saw all of his kingdom. She saw all of his servants. She saw all of those who were in attendance there with the professionalism and the way that he governed them. She had nothing else to say. And when she responded to Solomon, she gave him praise. She said, look, God has richly blessed you. He has given you great wisdom. And even what was told me could not even compare to what I have now experienced. And I think this text really tells or really speaks to the great wisdom that King Solomon has. Now, we don't know all of the different things that the Queen of Sheba talked to King Solomon about. That's not the point of this text. But it sure seems like she had a lot that she was going to say and a lot of hard questions for him to test his knowledge and to test his wisdom. He passed with flying colors. And I think something else about this text that we can say is that the queen of Sheba is able to kind of say thanks to the God that Solomon worshipped. There's no evidence that when she went back to her area or to her home, that she took, and wor- she took with her uh, the opportunity to worship the one true God. And so we always kind of have to have this in the back of our mind, that wisdom isn't the be-all, end-all of what we can do to proclaim God. Solomon had an opportunity, and we don't know if, like I said, Queen, the Queen of Sheba truly continued to worship the one true God or if she was just kind of affirming that particular God amongst a bunch of other gods. And so we always have to pay attention to that as well, that when we have wisdom and we ask the Lord for wisdom, we also want to ask him that it opens up the hearts of those that we're talking to, that they might receive God in Jesus Christ, and that they might receive the message and be able to not just say, your God is great because of the things that he has done for you amidst all of these other gods, but it truly gives them a time of reflection to think about God in their life and the way that God can work in their hearts and the power and the majesty of Jesus granting them grace and forgiveness, opportunity, inspiration, encouragement, and hope. If we're just wise beyond all of the other people of this world, that's great. But that's not going to save people. That's not going to help people get to heaven. All of the things that God gives to us must be building blocks to get them to the message of Jesus. And if we're not thinking that way, people can give praise to the God that we worship all they want, and they might continue to worship the God that they're worshiping. We want changed hearts that people might be saved in Jesus' name. Bless the Lord, O my 
Here's where we're going to talk about one of those controversial passages that might be, if we don't have the right and proper context, a way to kind of think, what is this talking about and what is this saying? This is written by King Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes. And so we're going to turn our attention to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, where it says this, In my vain life I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. 
Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Now let's go back and talk about that, because you're probably listening to that and thinking, what is Solomon saying in this? So let's go back kind of piece by piece, where he starts out, in my vain life, I have seen everything. And depending on your translation, um, the Ecclesiastes is famous for saying vanity, vanity, everything is vanity, or meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And King Solomon, towards the end of his life, or later on in his life, has seen that a lot of the things that he has pursued aren't really that important in the grand scheme of things. I think a lot of us, in our wisdom over the course of time, get a chance to see this as well. When we're younger, we pursue things that in the grand scheme of things really are not that important. And as wisdom is trying to impart knowledge and as Solomon is trying to pass on wisdom, he's trying to give those who are reading the opportunity to reflect on what is vanity. What are we pursuing that we don't necessarily need? What is meaningless? What are we pursuing that isn't necessarily helpful for us? And as king, when he's writing these words, it has even more weight and more power. And so we've got to be very careful that we put this in the right context to understand what he's saying. Because if we read this wrongly, we're going to, we're going to look at it and we're going to say, uh, I can't buy into that. I don't think you're right in what you're saying. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Solomon is saying everything that we can affirm just by looking around at what is going on in the situations in our lives. Unfortunately, sometimes people who have great faith and who are living the righteous life get hit by drunk drivers. People who have great faith get cancer or other uncurable diseases. And unfortunately, there are people outside of the faith who openly mock and scorn God by their unscrupulous attitude and nature and behavior. They're able to do things that makes their lives more comfortable for them. And sometimes they are even able to, quote-unquote, prolong their life By doing some of these things. Be not overly righteous. Do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? What? Why would he say that? Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? And on top of that, be not overly wicked. Neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Is he encouraging us to be wicked? Is he saying, why don't you back off on that righteousness a little bit? Focus a little bit less on the the wickedness, but still don't be afraid to be wicked in a certain amount of time or in certain places. It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. These last couple of verses here and what Solomon is talking about is simply a matter of looking at the world and the perspective that we should have. In all things, there needs to be a balance. What King Solomon is saying when he says, be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise, why should you destroy yourself? Sometimes, unfortunately, we pursue righteousness to the nth degree and we start to look at ourselves as being higher or mightier than other people. And sometimes we can just take it into our own hands when we look around at other people that that person's not living as rightly as I am. That person's not as righteous. Is that person really saved? Does that person really have the message of Jesus in their, hand, or in their heart? And it consumes us. And Solomon is saying, look, righteousness is great. Wisdom is great. But don't be consumed where your intentions turn the wrong way. And likewise, be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Understand that we are all sinful and limit these things 
so that you can have a better balance in your life of understanding who God is and how God works in your life. It is good that you should take hold of this and from that withhold not your hand, for the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Because of the sinfulness of man, we will always have a message of kind of this this tension in ourselves, within ourselves, uh, of being righteous and also being sinful. But God works through people and he works through his means through people. And so we have to understand and put this in perspective. Solomon is not encouraging us to go and be wicked. He is not saying, don't be righteous for the sake of being righteous. He is saying, think about God in all things. Understand your place in this world. Because when you go too far in one direction in anything, and there's not balance, it can become vanity or it can become meaningless very quickly. Look at God rightly. Follow God rightly, and he will show you and help you with balance. Every week we want to make the connection between the king that we're studying of the Old Testament and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 12 says this, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is is here. A great connection between Jesus and those who were great in the Old Testament. We don't often think of Jonah as being one of the great preachers of the Bible. We don't often think of Jonah as being one of the great evangelists of the Bible, but we know the story and we know what happened. But it's interesting that Jesus is saying, look, Jonah was a great preacher. An entire city was saved because of the way in which he brought the word of God to them. Solomon, likewise, and we think of, when we first think of Solomon, we think of the wisest person that's ever lived, and, and rightly that we should. That's exactly what Scripture says. The queen of Sheba came and heard all of these things, and the queen of Sheba will rise up at the end to look at all of those who listened to Jesus, who had the message of Jesus but didn't embrace it, in the same way that those who were uh, in Nineveh will rise up and look at all of those who had the message of Jesus and didn't handle it rightly, did not embrace it. All of those who actually listened to the word of God and understood the power of what was being said to them, 
they will condemn all of those who come after them who have the message of Jesus and don't embrace it. Because Jesus is a greater preacher than Jonah. His message is greater. He is more wise than Solomon. And we are called to embrace him. We are called to embrace the message of Jesus. And what a great connection this is. As wise as Solomon was, as much as he was able to do and accomplish during his reign as king over the people of Israel, our true king accomplished so much more. And his reign did not end in death. His reign continues even after his resurrection and his ascension into heaven and his lordship on the true throne. So the wisdom that Solomon had is nothing compared to the wisdom and power and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has been able to accomplish and what he continues to be able to accomplish in us. That's the sign that we should be looking at, understanding that Jesus rose from the dead, which makes him the true king over Israel. And nothing can stop him from continuing his reign over our lives with the grace that he gives to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, my light. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. As we conclude our service, may the grace and wisdom of our Lord, which surpasses Solomon, be with us and guard us from the folly of this world. In Jesus' name, amen.